everyone in this lecture we're going to be talking about the epithelial tissue and the different types of epithelial tissue epithelial tissue is going to have two main functions the first one is that it will cover body surfaces the second one is that it will form glands with regards to body surfaces it can either be external or internal External has to be the skin, right? Because the skin is what's located externally in our body. Internal, mainly, it's going to line organ systems, the inside of organ systems. So your digestive tract, your respiratory tract, even your heart, your blood vessels. And then it will also line your body cavities, which we mentioned in module one. We talked about the cranial and the thoracic the abdominal pelvic cavities, those are all lined by epithelial tissue. Because glands, they derive developmentally from body surfaces, therefore you can see the link to the epithelial tissue as well. We can classify epithelial tissue in two ways, either with regards to the number of cell layers or the shape of the cell. So let's talk about cell layers first. As you can see over here on the image, the tissues can either have one cell layer, like these, they only have one cell layer, or they can have more than one cell layer, like these. If they only have one cell layer, we call it simple. If they have more than one cell layer, we call it stratified. Now, with regards to the pseudostratified, pseudo means false. So that means that it looks like it's stratified, but it's really not stratified. It's a false stratified, meaning that these cells over here, sometimes they get squished here in the middle because they're so tightly packed together that it looks like they have more than one cell layer, but it, they really only have one cell layer. With regards to cell shape, we can say that they can be flat like these, they can be squared like these, or they can be rectangular like these. If they are flat, they're called squamous. If they are squared like these, they're called cuboidal. And if they are rectangular, they're called columnar. Therefore, when we put everything together, the cell layers with the shape of the cells, you're gonna get a simple squamous epithelium if it's one cell layer and flat cells. A simple cuboidal epithelium, if it's one cell layer and the cells are squared. A simple columnar epithelium, if the cells are rectangular in shape and you have one cell layer. If you have more than one cell layer, then you're gonna look at the cells that are located on the apical part of the tissue, so on the part that is further away from the basal lamina. Therefore, these cells over here look flat and they're more than one cell layer, so they're called stratified squamous epithelium. These look more like a square, so they're called stratified cuboidal epithelium. These look rectangular and there's more than one cell layer, so they're called stratified columnar epithelium. And again, with regards to the pseudostratified epithelium, they are usually columnar, but because they sometimes seem like they have more than one cell layer, they're called pseudostratified columnar epithelium. In this case, they're going to have the cilia. Remember how we talked about the cilia? That's gonna move particles for example, away from the lungs, if they're located in the respiratory tract. So that's why they're called, in this case, more specifically, it's called the pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium. Each type of epithelial tissue, it will perform a specific function. And here are examples of the functions. So it can either function to diffuse or filtrate, it can function as protection. It can function as secretion and absorption. It can function to change the shape of the tissue as it stretches. Or it can function also to produce a movement of a material. 
So I don't want you guys memorizing all the different types of epithelial tissue in all of the organs. But one thing that you guys should be thinking about is how are simple and stratified epithelial tissue different in terms of the function? What makes a difference between a squamous cell, which is flat, and a columnar cell, which is tall? So these types of characteristics of the epithelial tissue is what's going to tell you the function of each type of tissue. For you to have a function of diffusion and filtration, you cannot have a tissue that's very wide. You need to have a tissue that's narrow, thin. A thin tissue has to be composed of one cell layer and flat cells. The tissue that will be responsible for this function of diffusion and filtration has to be the simple squamous epithelium. So simple one cell layer squamous flat cells epithelium. In this example here we have blood vessels and it makes sense that blood vessels are going to be formed by a simple squamous epithelium as you're going to need fast exchange, a fast diffusion of nutrients and oxygen and carbon dioxide in the blood vessels. Even though these cells here of blood vessels, they are specialized cells that are called endothelial cells. So endothelial cells are epithelial cells that form blood vessels. To be able to protect, it would make sense that you would need a stratified epithelium. Therefore, all your stratified epithelia will function as protection. Here we have the stratified squamous epithelium. You can see how above here you're going to have flat cells. It is true that the first cell layer down here has cuboidal cells. But remember, when we're classifying the type of epithelia, we looked at the last cell layer to be able to classify it. Because these cells are flat, they're classified as squamous. More than one cell layer, stratified. So stratified squamous epithelium. This type of epithelium is found, for example, in the skin. And as these basal cells down here divide, they start to move up toward the surface and away from their supply of blood, which is down here on the connective tissue. Therefore, they become dehydrated and less metabolically active as they shrink in size. This is why the cells that are in the surface are flat and not cuboidal. We will talk in more details about this type of epithelium when we get to the integumentary system, which is going to be our next module. Next, we have the stratified cuboidal epithelium. As you can see, it's made of two cell layers in which the cells in the apical layer are cuboid in shape. This is a fairly rare type of epithelium. They're located in ducts of adult sweat glands and also in the esophageal glands and part of the male urethra. The main thing that you need to know is that it functions for protection. You can actually think about this. The esophagus is going to be the passageway between the mouth and the stomach. And if you eat a chip that you don't chew well enough, then it scrapes the esophagus lining and therefore you need to have it protected. So this is why it's made up of a stratified, in this case, it's a cuboidal epithelium. Next, we have what we call the stratified columnar epithelium. Usually the basal cells are going to be shortened and irregular in shape. Only the apical layer will have cells that are columnar in shape or rectangular. Similar to the stratified cuboidal epithelium, the stratified columnar epithelium also has a function that is not known. They're going to be located in part of the urethra, large excretory ducts of some glands, such as esophageal glands, small areas in the anal mucous membrane, and also in part of the eye. The main thing that I want you to know about this function of protection is that the stratified epithelia is the one that's going to be able to exert this function. 
Next, we have the epithelia that function for secretion and absorption. The first type over here is the simple cuboidal epithelium. The next is going to be the non-ciliated simple columnar epithelium. And the third one is the non-ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium. And what they have in common is that all of them are only going to have one cell layer. So for you to have secretion and absorption, it does not make sense that you're going to have several cell layers because the absorption is going to, for example, take a long time if you have to go through several cell layers. So this is why for you to have this type of function, you can only have one cell layer. With regards to the simple cuboidal epithelium, you can see how the cells are going to be displayed into one layer and you're going to have this squared shape. That's why it's called a simple cuboidal epithelium. They're going to be located, for example, on the surface of ovaries. They're going to line interior surface of capsule of the lens of the eyes. They're going to form pigmented epithelium at the posterior surface of the retina of the eye. They're going to line kidney tubules and smaller ducts of many glands. And they're also going to make up the secretory portion of some of the glands as the thyroid gland and also the pancreas. Again, the main thing that you need to know is that for you to have secretion and absorption, you can only have it in simple epithelia. Next, in the middle, we're going to talk about the non-ciliated simple columnar epithelium. So non-ciliated means that it doesn't have a cilia, which are the hairs. Here, these do look like they're hair, but they're actually microvilli. So they are going to increase the surface area in this type of tissue. If it's increasing the surface area, it means that it's going to be for absorption, right? Because you need to have an increased surface area to be able to optimize the absorption of this tissue. You can see how it's uh, made up of one cell layer and these cells are rectangular. Therefore, they're going to be columnar. And like I said, the microvilli gives you already a clue of where this type of epithelium is located. So it's going to line the gastrointestinal tract all the way from the stomach to the anus because it will help with that absorption. It also is present in some of the glands and the gallbladder. The main thing that you need to know, if it has microvilli, it will increase absorption due to an increase in the surface area. Also notice on this image how we're going to have other types of cells like the goblet cells over here right in the middle. And these goblet cells they are going to be important because they will secrete mucus which will serve as a lubricant for the lining of the digestive, the respiratory and the reproductive tracts. One of the functions of the presence of this mucus is to help prevent the destruction of the stomach lining by the acid gastric juice that's secreted by the stomach. As we know, the stomach is very acidic, so this mucus helps to protect the lining of the stomach. Last, we have the non-ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium. It does appear to have several cell layers because the nuclei of these cells are at various levels. Even though all the cells are going to be attached to the basement membrane in a single layer, some cells do not extend to the apical surface. Actually, when viewed from the side, these features, they're going to give you a false impression of a multi-layered tissue. But remember that the name pseudo-stratified means a false stratified. So it's going to contain only one cell layer. This specific tissue is non-ciliated, but we do have ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium. The non-ciliated is going to line the epididymis, large ducts of many glands, such as the parotid glands, which are salivary glands, and parts of the male urethra, and they will function for absorption and secretion. The ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium will be located 
most of the respiratory tract, and we will cover it in a couple of slides. The transitional epithelium is an epithelium that we did not cover yet. As you can see, it's made up of several cell layers. The cell layers are going to be a little bit more rounded, and we're going to find two different states of the transitional epithelium. We're going to have a relaxed state and a distended state. Because this epithelium is found, for example, in the urinary bladder, if you have an empty urinary bladder, we can say that it's in a relaxed state. Therefore, the cells can be a little bit more rounded, especially on top. As your urinary bladder fills, it becomes in what we call the distended state. So the cells are going to distend, they're going to stretch out. This is why it's called a transitional epithelium, because it transitions from one type of cell to a different type of cell. So it goes from a relaxed state to a distended state. Because it also has several cell layers, it will function as protection as well. Besides being present in the urinary bladder, it will also line portions of the ureter and the urethra. But they're all part of the urinary system, so it might be a little bit easier for you to remember. Last, we have the epithelium that will produce movement of material. For it to produce the movement, it needs to be ciliated. So it needs to contain the cilia right over here on top. There are two types of ciliated epithelium. We have the simple columnar, as we can see right over here. And we have the pseudostratified. See how the cells are sort of squished over here? And it gives the impression that there are several cell layers, but it's really one cell layer. The ciliated simple columnar epithelium, it will line some of the bronchioles, which are the small tubes of the respiratory tract. It will also line the uterine tubes, which are known also as fallopian tubes. It will line the uterus, some of the paranasal sinuses, the central canal of the spinal cord so that you can have CSF circulating and also ventricles of the brain. And the ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium, it will line most of the upper respiratory tract. And because again, it has these goblet cells right over here, it will produce the mucus that will help to trap these foreign objects or particles that enter into the respiratory tract and try to avoid them from entering into the lungs. This slide is mainly to summarize everything that we talked about. It's also a good idea that you do your own table to understand the different functions of the different types of epithelia that's present in our body. Up to now, we covered one of the main functions of the epithelial tissue, which is to cover body surfaces either internally or externally. And now we're going to be talking about the formation of glands, which is the other function of the epithelial tissue. There are two different types of glands. We have what we call the endocrine glands and the exocrine glands. The main difference between exocrine glands and endocrine glands is that the exocrine glands, they're going to secrete a substance into a duct system within the epithelial surface and the endocrine glands are, go are going to secrete their products directly into the bloodstream. Because the endocrine glands they're going to secrete directly into the bloodstream, they're going to be able to regulate these metabolic and physiological activities to maintain homeostasis. And the exocrine glands are going to release sweat, oil, earwax, saliva, and even digestive enzymes as the secretory products onto the epithelial tissue. Like I said on the previous slide, the secretions that are called hormones made by the endocrine glands, they're going to enter this interstitial fluid and then diffuse directly into the bloodstream without flowing through the duct. The exocrine glands are the ones that will have ducts. Locations for these endocrine glands, they're going to be the pituitary gland at the base of the brain. You have your pineal gland that's going to be located within the brain. There's also the thyroid and parathyroid glands, 
All of this will be your thyroid gland and the four small ones over here are going to be your parathyroid gland. They are located near the larynx. Then you have the adrenal glands, which are also called suprarenal glands. Suprarenal means that they're going to be on top of the kidneys. You're going to have the pancreas that's going to be important for digestion. You're going to have the ovaries and the testes. Ovaries are located in females. Testes are the homologous structures for males. In addition, you have the thymus, which is located right over here below the larynx. And the main function of all these hormones produced by these glands are to regulate the metabolic and physiological activities to maintain homeostasis. All these glands are usually covered in the endocrine system, which you guys will see when you take ANP2. So for now, we're going to focus on the exocrine glands. Exocrine glands, like we said, are going to secrete their products into ducts that will empty onto the surface of a covering or lining epithelium, such as skin surface or lumen of a hollow organ. There are two different types of exocrine glands. We have what we call the unicellular type of exocrine gland and the multicellular. Uni, like the name says, means one, so single-celled glands. Example of a unicellular exocrine gland is going to be your goblet cells, which are these right over here. And you can see that they will secrete their products onto the lumen of the tissue. With regards to multicellular glands, we're going to see them on the next slide. Here is a list of the multicellular exocrine glands. They can be categorized into two criteria, whether their ducts are branched it's called a compound or unbranched will be called simple and also the shape of the secretory portions of the glands which we will discuss using this image i think it's best if we define the terms first so if it's tubular it's going to represent secretory parts that forms a tube acinar which can also be called alveolar is going to represent secretory portions that are more rounded. And the tubular acinar is going to have both, a tubular and a rounded secretory portion. When we mean tubular, this is what we're talking about. It forms like a little tube. When we're talking about acinar or alveolar, they're more rounded, like this one. Simple means that it has one duct. So all these are simple. And compound means that it will have several ducts. Therefore, we can see that this would be a simple tubular. This would be a simple coiled tubular because it forms like a little coil over here. And this would be a simple branched tubular because it does branch out even though it has only one duct but what's branching out is the portion of the gland. For simple alveolar, it will have only one duct and then the gland, which is more rounded. Simple branched, meaning that the portion of the gland will be branched out. And down here we have all the compounds. This would be your acinar because it forms rounded glands and it has more than one duct. This would be your compound tubular. Notice how the glands form like a little tube. And then the compound tubular alveolar or acinar, it's going to have the tubes and the rounded glands. We can also classify the exocrine gland according to the function. So the way that they secrete their products there are three types, mericrine, apocrine, and holocrine. And the way that they secrete, it goes from a more simple type of secretion, which is the mericrine, to a more complex type of secretion, which is the holocrine. The way that I remember is by thinking about ma. So it goes from the more simple type of secretion to the more complex type 
of secretion, and we're going to discuss them on the next slides. Secretions from mirocrine glands, which are also called ecrine glands, are going to be synthesized in the ribosomes attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. They're going to be processed, sorted out, and packaged by the Golgi complex right over here. They're going to be released from the cells in these secretory vesicles right over here via exocytosis. Most of the exocrine glands of the body, they're going to be this type of glands. An example can be salivary glands or pancreas. The most important thing for you to realize is because these secretory products, they're released through exocytosis, the cells, they're going to remain intact. Next, we have the apocrine cells, which are going to accumulate the secretory products on the apical part of the cell, so the top part of the cell. Then what happens is that there's a pinching off. See how this membrane gets squeezed right over here? And therefore, the secretory products, they get released with part of the cytoplasm of the cell. Because the nucleus remains here, then the cell is able to regenerate the portion that got removed. So the cell does not die, but it's different from the miracrine type of secretion where you only create secretory vesicles that are released through exocytosis. An example of this is the secretion of milk fats in mammary glands. In contrast to the apocrine that accumulates their secretory products in the apical portion of the cell, the holocrines, they're going to accumulate their secretory products in the cytosol. As the secretory products are going to mature, it's going to rupture the cell and becomes the secretory product itself. Because the cell ruptures in this mode of secretion, the secretion consists of a considerable amount of lipids from the plasma membrane and also the intercellular membrane. These cells that are being removed, because they're dying, they're going to be replaced by new cells. One example of holocrine gland is the sebaceous gland of the skin. And we will cover more about this when we talk about the skin in the next module. So to summarize the holocrine secretion, it's going to be when the cell is going to be destroyed as it releases its products and the cell itself becomes part of the secretion. Epithelial tissue, they do have common structural characteristics, which we will cover on the following slides. They are cellularity, polarity, attachment, avascularity, regeneration, and the fact that it covers body surfaces. The first one is cellularity. Mainly cellularity means that there is little or no space between the cells and this is due to the specialized cell junctions that we already talked about. Therefore the cell junctions are the ones responsible for giving this characteristic of cellularity. As you can see in this image there's really no space between the adjacent cells. Next we have polarity. Polarity can be a little bit confusing because usually when we think about polarity, we think about charges. However, in epithelial tissue, polarity just means that the apical part of the cell is going to be exposed. Therefore, we can see right over here that the apical part is going to be exposed to the surface or to the lumen of an organ, and the basal surface will be attached to the basal lamina. And this also means that the organelles within the cell, they're not going to be distributed evenly. So there's going to be usually a nucleus that's going to be further down. Up here, you're going to have the Golgi complex. Down here, you're going to have mitochondria. It's not like you usually have a cell with the nucleus in the middle and then the organelles are spread evenly. Polarity means this, that the organelles are also spread unevenly within the cell. Next we have attachment, which mainly means that the epithelium is going to be attached to the connective tissue through what we call the basement membrane. Now the basement membrane is divided into two layers. You're going to have the basal lamina 
and the reticular lamina. There are specific functions of the basement membrane, which are listed over here. But for us, the main thing that we want to know is that the epithelium is attached to the connective tissue through the basement membrane. Next, we have a vascularity. A vascularity means that there are no blood vessels. So vascularity means blood vessels and A means no. So no blood vessels. On the image, we can see the epidermis right over here, which is going to be formed by the epithelium or epithelial tissue. Below the epidermis, we have the dermis. Notice over here how we have all these blood vessels. So this would be in blue, a vein, in red, an artery. And these blood vessels are the ones that are going to be supplying the nutrients to the epithelium up here. The nutrients are going to pass from the dermis which is the connective tissue, to the epidermis, which is the epithelial tissue. This process occurs by diffusion, and we will talk more when we get to the next module, which is integumentary system, where we will cover the skin. Next, we have generation, which means that we're going to generate new cells. In this example here, we're talking about the epidermis. Therefore, these cells over here are what we call keratinocytes. The keratinocytes are going to be regenerated from what we call stem cells. So these stem cells, they will divide and differentiate into new keratinocytes that will then move up this ladder. As you can see down here, you're going to have the young keratinocytes. They're going to move up and become old keratinocytes where they're going to die and become flat. And then you're going to shed this top layer over here of dead cells. Of course, we're going to cover all this when we talk about the integumentary system, but the main thing that we need to know for this module is how regeneration functions or what's the meaning of regeneration, which means that you're going to have the differentiation of new cells from stem cells. The last common structural characteristic is the fact that the epithelial cells, they're going to cover body surfaces. And all this we already covered in the beginning of this learning outcome, how the epithelial tissue covers either external or internal surfaces. Therefore, I don't think that there's any need to cover it again on this slide.